first off, thank you so much for inviting me back to speak with the cab. I It's one of my favorite things that I got to do when I was in Seattle. And I'm so, so thrilled to be back here chatting with everyone about, like Michael said, the work that originated um, at the ACTU and um, particularly when I was a postdoc. My mentor, so, and she's on this call as well, which is um, really, really exciting for me because um, it's coming full circle. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just chat briefly about some of the um, initial work that we did um, while we were in Washington and the um, particularly focusing on the paper that we published in clinical infectious disease on some of this work and highlights from that. And then also share with you some information that we recently were able to get through some work that I have been doing with the ACTG looking at their HALO cohort. And so um, this is really uh, serendipitous, but I'm just gonna build right off of what Michael was saying. So we have now reached 40 years of the AIDS epidemic. And I think that um, uh, this can really, you know, there's been a lot of really wonderful progress that we've made um, in H the HIV AIDS research field where we know what causes AIDS and it's uh, that HIV is the etiologic agent. Um, there is, are really great lab tests that we have that can diagnose and monitor the infection. We know how it originated and we have lots of really great antiretroviral drugs that can be used to suppress viral replication, but we still do have a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, we still don't have a vaccine or a long lasting microbicide that can um, uh, prevent new infections. We don't have a treatment that can eradicate the infection um, and an incomplete understanding of the pathogenesis. Um, and one thing that we really have come to know in the HIV AIDS research field is that um, chronic inflammation is really important. So just to really basic and broad um, talk about inflammation for a second um, and what inflammation is. Um, it's a natural immune process. Everyone, you know, can be inflamed at some point in response to an infection. And there's both acute in inflammation, which doesn't last very long, and chronic inflammation. And what we know in the HIV in, uh, field is that people that are living with HIV experience chronic inflammation, where they have, and this chronic inflammation can lead to immune cell dysfunction and damage and could be caused by any number of things. But it's gonna be really important for us to figure out how to reduce inflammation um, because it can uh, um, be, it's been shown to be a predictor of morbidity and mortality. And so there's been a lot of research showing how important chronic inflammation is. And so the um, ability to, to form new um, uh, therapeutics or interventions that can be used to reduce inflammation is a, a, a area of great interest to us. Um, and what's important, I think, to highlight is that even though we do have a number of really wonderful antiretroviral therapy drugs that can be used to reduce uh, or to limit completely viral replication, um, and there's a lot of other benefits of antiretroviral drugs, what we find is that inflammation and this chronic inflammation that is experienced by people living with HIV continues to be a problem despite complete viral replication. And so one of the things that we became interested in looking at um, in terms of trying to limit inflammation uh, was cannabis. And this was really Nikki's brainchild that she developed um, and was uh, got a really great grant to um, pursue this research. And the thought was that there's there was a lot of anecdotal evidence and some published literature out there that showed that cannabis could be used to limit inflammation. And so with, with what we wanted to do was really investigate how it could limit inflammation um, and what the effects were in HIV, people living with HIV. And the reason for this was not just because of the um, uh, literature and evidence out there for cannabis limiting inflammation, but because cannabis is really commonly used among people living with HIV. And in fact, there is evidence out there that shows that um, use of cannabis reaches 23 to 56% as compared to 13% in the general population. Um, and there's really conflicting evidence out there supporting whether or not cannabis has a beneficial or del deleterious effect among people living with HIV. Um, reasons for use 
use of cannabis among people living with HIV um, are any number of reasons, including reduction of anxiety, stress, physical pain, uh, lots of different reasons. And we really need more focused research to understand what the effects of cannabis could be in this vulnerable population. And just some highlights from what is known in the field about cannabis and um, uh, people living with HIV. This was a study that was done in rhesus macaques showing, uh, looking at cannabinoid administration and the um, simian immunodeficiency virus. And what this is, is the um, monkey uh, version of HIV. Um, and so we can use this model to, to do mechanistic studies um, to understand what could be happening um, in people living with HIV. And what these uh, this group showed was that administration of cannabinoids really did um, seem to have a beneficial impact on the SIV infection, including increased survival and decreased SIV replication, both in vitro and in vivo. And so this is one of the papers that suggests that cannabis could have a beneficial effect. Um, there was another- uh, me, uh, Can I ask a question? Of course. Yes, can we go back a, to oh, that yes. slide? I don't know if everybody knows, but what is a cannabinoid? Oh, yes. Those, but like, what does it, what does that mean in terms of, I know what pot is or cannabis, but what's a cannabinoid? Sure. So cannabinoids are basically components of the cannabis plant. And so it's, it's the parts that could be um, uh, uh, the part, the components that could be having an effect when cannabis is ingested. So for example, here, the particular cannabinoid that they were looking at is THC, which I think um, most people like, you know, they hear that word, they think, oh yes, the THC content. So right. THC is a, is a, is a type of component of the um, cannabis that could be causing um, the effects of that we see. Right. So this is different than THC or is THC a cannabinoid? THC is a cannabinoid. Okay. Got it. But there are a lot of other cannabinoids as well. Correct. Right. Correct. So the other one that I think is probably most widely used and heard of these days is CBD or cannabidiol, which of course is not psychoactive. Um, well, it is mild, very mildly compared to THC. So those are two of the, the big ones that are used. So, and, and typically when you, you know, if you go to a dispensary, you will see a THC or CBD or THC to CBD ratio. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately you can't go on with the dispensaries. I'll be sick because they're not, their labs aren't always doing it correctly. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying more for reference of what people know um, yeah. and, and what, what people are familiar with. But yes, I, I would not trust much of the accuracy of that. And sorry for the barking puppy. Is, is that your dog? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and just can I say this real fast? Um, sure. The actual um, main benefits from uh, cannabis is uh, juicing the whole entire plant itself, making juice out of it and ingesting it that way You because you get the most bene medical benefits from the um, cannabinoids and the whole plant itself. Um, and we had another question that someone put into the chat. I wanted to, while we stopped, they wanted to know like, what are the symptoms of inflammation? What does inflammation like feel like in the body or what is it, how does it manifest? Sure. So inflammation is um, essentially there's there's a uh, um, uh, there was there's like five signs like when you think of like for example if you um, get a cut and you get heat and redness and um, uh, that's on the surface you know of the skin just for sort of a visual representation mm -hmm. right. but yes heat redness swelling those are signs of inflammation and so when we are thinking about this in the context of a of a viral infection you know we see a lot of of uh, immune cells activating and responding and so it's not like a visual you don't normally or well you not always will get a visual representation like having a cut and having that redness and swelling, but internally in your lymphoid organs where your immune cells live, um, you, your immune cells will be responding and uh, that will, that's essentially a broad version of what we mean by, by inflammation. Cool. And is there stuff that treats it? So there are anti-inflammatory uh, agents and uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, 
I'm not super familiar with how they uh, like the the logistics of how they've been used in order in, in um, HIV infection. But the idea is that the chronic inflammation, there's really no no good way yet to reduce it to levels that you would see before um, that would be in an uninfected individual as compared to an uninfected individual. Right. So we can't bring that down just because there's always that like low, low boil going on. It's always activated. It's always going on. Okay. Right. Right. And that, and that is the goal, right? The goal is to find a way to reduce that chronic inflammation to levels that are comparable to an uninfected individual. Um, because there always is just that low level. And even with antiretroviral therapy, it doesn't, that doesn't seem to go away completely. Right. Right. But Michael, before uh, HIV, we used to treat inflammation with uh, aspirin, uh, would have a, mi a mild effect on reducing inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, more a stronger medication would be like the, non the NSAIDs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ibuprofen and right. uh, Aleve and those things. Right. Uh, and then the strongest anti-inflammatory drugs are steroids, mm. uh, greatly reduce inflammation. Uh, but uh, side effects are sort of proportional to the strength of the anti-inflammatory drug. Mm. Aspirin w could cause gastritis and, and actually a GI bleed if it were used over a long time or in large doses. Mm. Uh, steroids... Uh, caused the most serious in, uh, side effects uh, with uh, changes in uh, thinking uh, mm. and uh, also uh, uh, GI uh, disease uh, wow. ulcers and so on. Right. And so uh, an inflammation can be local or, or sort of systemic. Uh, if inflammation is occurring in the gut, uh, people People may not notice it very much. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, people with ulcerative colitis or regional enteritis have serious inflammation in the gut and a lot of pain, as, as you see on television ads. Right. <laughs> right. And um, so th just so everyone is aware, then we're talking about HIV as a chronic inflammation that's also systemic, right? It's not just in one area. It's it's going to be yeah, everywhere, right? It may also be focused in the gut because we know that gut gut inflammation is very common mm -hmm. in people with HIV. Which I think is going to come with, with Jen's work because I know Jen and they were getting pieces of the gut or trying to get pieces of the gut. So go on, Jen. Sorry to interrupt. No, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so... Uh, Right. So this study I found very interesting. This was a, um, a, a study done in, in um, people that are were at high risk for acquiring HIV infection. Um, and they followed them to look at uh, the time point specifically when they were going to be seroconverting, seroconverting, so acquiring HIV infection. And they were following these individuals and looking, dividing them up into whether or not they used daily cannabis or essentially less than daily cannabis use. And what they found were that the people that were participating in daily, more than daily cannabis use had a lower um, HIV viral load when they um, seroconverted or acquired HIV infection as compared to individuals who didn't participate in uh, more daily or more than daily cannabis usage, suggesting that the um, cannabis use um, could be having an impact on what your um, what you look like when you acquire HIV infection, um, which has been related to uh, disease progression and severity of infection. So that's why we care about uh, what your viral load looks like when you seroconvert. Oops. Oh, why is this not? And from our neighbors in Canada. I'm sorry. And from Canada. Yes. Yes. That study was done in with a, by a group in Canada. Um, and so what I want to show here is essentially what our, our thought is for why we wanted to kind of drawing together what I've shown you so far and how we wanted to progress with this project. So we know that HIV has this uh, vicious cycle of inflammation and uh, infection of target cells, disruption of immunity and health. 
um, and that it can contribute to development of non-AIDS morbidities and mortalities, immune deficiencies, and all of this feeds back into each other, continuously driving the infection. And as I've mentioned, we have wonderful HIV antiretroviral drugs that can be used to reduce a lot of these symptoms, but none of them seem to quite go away, including this inflammation. Um, and immune activation, which could be contributing to risk for morbidities and mortality among people living with HIV. And so our hypothesis was to look at the impact of cannabis use, both for its potential anti-inflammatory properties and because we really needed to understand what the use of cannabis was, is uh, what the impact of cannabis use in this population is having, because there just wasn't a lot of really good information available and so the way that we started this project was to, um, oh, oh, this was our, uh, our question, what is the impact of uh, cannabis use on inflammation and immune activation among people living with HIV? And then we hypothesized specifically that people living with HIV who use cannabis would have reduced indicators of inflammation and immune activation. Um, so the way that we approached this uh, project first was to use samples from a repository in um, San Francisco. And we worked with Dr. Peter Hunt uh, with the SCOPE cohort to um, obtain uh, different samples from individuals that were enrolled in their SCOPE study. And what we got were two different types of samples. So peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which are um, essentially white blood cells from um, blood draws and also plasma from the same matched individuals. So we got uh, plasma and uh, peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells from the same individual at the same time point. And I won't go through all of the different things that we did, but we did a number of different assays in order to really understand what was happening uh, in these individuals. Um, what's really important to point out here as well is that we were able to collect uh, um, samples from individuals that reported as having used daily cannabis and as well as individuals who report not using cannabis. And so what we, um, we were able to directly compare the two different groups of individuals. Um, one of the first things that we wanted to do, and this is, uh, I, I don't want to get too into the weeds about this, um, but one of the first things that we did was try to verify cannabis usage, um, because it was really important for us to understand who exactly was using cannabis at the time of the, of the sample collection as compared to individuals who weren't. The reason that that's really important is because it's possible that a lot of the discrepancies that we had seen in the literature before about the impact of cannabis among people living with HIV is because reporting for cannabis usage isn't always accurate. And so by doing this experiment to look at exactly the levels of, of cannabinoids in the plasma of individuals that had reported cannabis use or not really allowed us to, to very, very well confirm um, cannabis use among these individuals. And so what I'm showing here are, this is actually coming back to some different cannabinoids. So this is our, our Delta 9 THC and a couple of the other cannabinoids, which again are the components of the cannabis that um, uh, uh, we were able to look at, were just some other uh, THC components here. So um, fancy names here are 11-hydroxy-THC, norcarboxy-THC. But essentially what this is telling us is that the people, for the most part, the people that said that they were cannabis users did indeed have cannabis in their system at the time. So this is really good for us. We have confirmed cannabis usage. You've definitely determined that the cannabis users were using cannabis. Do you, did you see that make a big difference in what you found? So actually we will, and, and I'm going to get to that. That's actually one of the exciting parts about this study. Cool. Um, so Yes. So essentially, yes, we've, we've, we've verified the cannabis users are in fact cannabis users. And also it was helpful because some, some of the individuals that said they weren't cannabis users did in fact have cannabis in their system. So we were able to really clean up our, our data set here, right? And have people that are, are confirmed cannabis users or non-users. And yes, to your point, how this could affect our study. So in addition to just verifying usage, we were also able to, among the people that had detectable levels of cannabinoids, um, go back, oh gosh, sorry. Um, 
we were able to divide up the individuals that were cannabis users into levels of use. So mm -hmm. according to how much uh, cannabinoids they had in their, how, how many cannabinoids they had in their system at the time of the sample collection, we were able to say whether or not they were an occasional user, a moderate user, a really high user. And this was quite helpful to us because it could also, the effects that we're seeing could also be an, a dose effect, right? So we were able to really delve into what the difference between these uh, individuals could be. I'm sorry, I see a, a hand up. Kate. What do you classify as a medium user to a heavy user? My question is who? So this was based off of um, previous studies that were um, their pharmacokinetic studies, which um, I am not an expert in pharmacokinetics at all, but essentially what we're trying to do here is say, it's it's an amount of use, right? So what they had done was, was uh, um, enroll participants into a separate, completely separate study where they gave individuals cannabis to use and then did sample collections over time. And they were able to track and say, someone who has a lot of cannabis in their system at the time has this level of cannabinoids and specifically this, this THC, this carboxy THC uh, cannabinoid that they were looking at. Whereas someone who had less cannabis or doesn't use cannabis as regularly, this is the, the range of amount that you would see in their plasma at the time of sample collection to classify them as someone who uses cannabis maybe once a day, w once or twice a week as compared to a heavy user who would be using multiple times a day. So that's how we, that's how we were able to, to divide up. And we used their, uh, um, their numbers for what uh, the cannabinoids that this particular cannabinoid that we were looking at to basically divide up our population. So somebody who smoked every day uh, throughout from the beginning of the morning until they go to bed at night that was involved in the study, would they give, did they give uh, better results than those who were medium users or those that, that smoked once they started the study? Fabulous question. And I'm going to answer that in a second. Okay. Any other questions right now? Okay. So, uh, so we have our population of cannabis users that we've divided up into uh, heavy users and, and moderate users. And, and uh, one, th one last thing I'll mention on this slide is that we only had three individuals that we were able to classify as an occasional user. So we, we really focused our analysis on these moderate and, and heavy users. So I'm only going to be showing data from these two groups and the non-cannabis users. Um, why won't this let me advance? Oh, here we go. Okay. So um, one of the ways in which we have been able to essentially quantify uh, immune activation and inflammation. And one of the things that's very important in uh, HIV infection are your T cell counts and your CD, specifically your, how many CD4 T cells you have around. And so what we wanted to look at first was just a broad overview of, of T cells and what, how many, what the frequency is of T cells that we see in these different groups. So non-cannabis users, moderate users, and heavy users. And what we found when we looked at both CD4 and CD8 T cells, which are two different classes of T cells, was that the overall frequency of T cells in these different groups was about the same. But what was really cool was when we were able to look at the activation. So the way that we identify T cell activation in the lab is we look at expression of two different markers on these T cells. So we use CD38 and HLA-DR. And so this marker of, of, infl of immune activation so T cells is a way that's classically been used to, to measure immune activation in people living with HIV. And what we found was that this measure of immune activation, so this, this, these double positive T cells in both CD4 and CD8 T cells was significantly lower in the heavy cannabis users as compared to the non-users. So the, the take home message from this is that yes, the cannabis users did appear to have lower immune activation as compared to the non-cannabis users. And again, this is, this is important for us because immune activation and inflammation has been tied to um, morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV. So um, that was really, really exciting for us to see. Um, and we saw it confirmed in both the CD4 and the CD8 T cells. Um, one other bit of data that I just wanted to share briefly, um, this is not happy with me. Here we go. Okay, so my favorite 
uh, cell subset are <laughs> monocytes. Um, that's quite nerdy, but um, they're definitely my favorite cells. Um, and one of the things that I was really interested to look at in this study was to, to look at monocytes. And, and uh, there's definitely evidence out there that shows that um, different monocyte subsets are also like uh, um, activated T cells are tied to inflammation and immune activation and disease progression and um, morbidity and mortality in people living with HIV. And so this is just a picture of how we, how we identify the cells. Um, and what we found was that when we looked at a couple different monocyte subsets, so classical monocytes tend to be more anti-inflammatory. They're, um, and they're definitely higher in um, uh, uninfected individuals as compared to infected individuals. And what we found was that we actually see a significant increase in the frequency of classical monocytes in the cannabis users, and specifically the heavy users, as compared to the non-cannabis users. And when we look, it's a lot, a bit more evident here when we look at non-classical monocytes, which are typically more inflammatory, um, that we see a significant decrease in the number or the frequency of um, uh, non-classical monocytes sites in the heavy users, and in fact, also in the moderate cannabis users, as compared to the non-cannabis users. And again, why this is important is because they could be contributing to this immune activation and inflammation. And so if we see less of it in the cannabis users, that could indicate that cannabis is potentially having a beneficial impact by decreasing the number of these cells that are hanging around um, in, in, uh, these, uh, this, in this population. So we want lower Monoculite. We yes. want lower counts of those, which means lower inflammation in the body, correct? That's what our hypothesis is, yes. So potentially, if these cells are um, contributing to inflammation by producing, you know, uh, inflammatory mediators, um, if we have fewer of them, or if we just, you know, have a shift in the number from this particular subset to a classical monocyte, which could be producing anti-inflammatory mediators, then yes, potentially that could be, have a beneficial clinical implication. Okay. Thank you. Yes, of course. So that was all very exciting. Um, and again, that was from our um, study that we published in uh, 2018. And it was all using repository samples. And so, and a lot of that was done through the help of the ACTU as well as other um, researchers at the UW. And what we next wanted to do was to really move forward with um, investigating this because what, what we were looking at in our, in our first study, which is uh, the data that I just showed you, it was all systemic and we were very interested in the gut, um, are very interested in the gut because the gut is a place where immune, there's a huge population of immune cells that, um, that reside in the gut. And it's a place where we can get a lot of inflammation and um, uh, it's very important in um, uh, immune activation. Um, and so, and so what we were working on with the ACTU was to really delve into not just what's happening systemically, but also what's happening in this very important mucosal tissue of the intestine. And so we built off of that study by replicating the groups that we wanted to look at. So cannabis users versus non-cannabis users. And here we were able to expand our study into both HIV positive cannabis users and HIV negative cannabis users, as well as the control groups that don't use cannabis in each of those. And rather than just collecting blood and looking at uh, immune cells in the blood and in the plasma, we were also collecting colon biopsies, uh, urine, stool, rectal swabs, and doing a variety of different tests in order to really understand um, what's happening, not just systemically, but in this very important mucosal tissue. Highlights. So what we found, so, and actually Nikki is probably a better person to speak to some of the more recent work that's been done with this sample subset, um, but highlights from uh, uh, what I was, uh, had slides on. Um, <laughs> what we were able to, in our initial analyses, what we found is that the, um, uh, basically we confirmed our results. So not only were we able to see lower frequencies of uh, T cells that were um, activated in the periphery, but we also see redu re saw reductions of those cells in the colon, suggesting that the impacts of cannabis are not just systemically, but also in immune tissue in, in, um, in the intestine. 
Um, we were also, uh, there was a graduate student named Ryan Chu who did some really interesting work to look at short chain fatty acids, which are um, a microbial derived metabolite that's important in maintaining um, uh, mucosal um, integrity, mucosal barrier integrity. And what he was show, was able to show was that um, the cannabis users, and especially even among the HIV infected cannabis users, um, had uh, greater levels of short chain fatty acids indicating better intestinal health in those individuals. Um, I don't know if Nikki is, is, I can't see anybody. So is Nikki still around? I'm here. Hi, Nikki. Yeah. Um, I can comment on what we're doing. So this is such a beautiful data set that we're so fortunate to work so closely with Anne and Michael and the rest of the team there to get. So we have tons of these samples left. And the next step we are right now, um, and Ross Cromarty is a newer postdoc in the lab who's also on the phone or on the call, but um, he is leading a study where we are going to be assessing um, drug metabolism and microbiome changes in these patients. Um, so looking at, you know, antiretroviral drug levels. And yes, my dogs are resting in the background. I'm glad, I'm guessing that's why Michael's laughing. They're in the background. <laughs> yes, they are. They, I was at the gym after work, so they were a little cooped up and it's raining. So sorry about that. It, it looks like Seattle here today, Minnesota. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, no, but it's great that we still, you know, I mean, that we are going to get so much data out of these samples. It's really exciting. It's a really valuable data set. Thank you. Cool. So shifting gears just a little bit. Um, I was fortunate, oh, uh, this is just my summary slide showing that, um, uh, kind of summing up what I've been uh, sharing with you from our, our published and recent studies that um, we think that heavy cannabis use is associated with a potentially beneficial reduction in inflammation and immune activation in the context of art treated HIV infection, um, that potentially it could be associated with lower mucosal immune activation and essentially the take home message from this is that um, potentially non-psychoactive cannabis derivatives could be investigated further as novel anti-inflammatory strategies that could be used in conjunction with antiretroviral therapy to improve outcomes in people living with HIV. And so what I would like to share now is um, some a small study that I did um, in collaboration with um, the HALO uh, cohort. So HALO cohort is an ACTG study where they're longitudinally following um, older people living with HIV. And it's a, it's a really rich data set because they've been able to follow these individuals for many, many, many years. And what's, what's great about it, uh, an additional great thing about it is that they have um, all of these individuals in the HALO study are um, on antiretroviral therapy. So they're all suppressed and we can follow long-term what's happening in these individuals. And so one of the things that I mentioned um, is that, you know, we're all well aware of this, that um, art adherence is very, has a lot of beneficial effects such as, you know, of course, sustaining your viral suppression, reducing risk of drug resistance, better overall health, improved quality of life and decreased risk of HIV transmission. But as I mentioned in the very beginning, there's really some discrepancies right between um, what the literature is showing is a, is a um, whether cannabis has a beneficial impact or a deleterious effect. And so we wanted to investigate specifically among older individuals living with HIV. And so we were able to basically do a retro analysis of collected data from the HALO cohort and look at, um, we started just with art adherence. So we wanted to understand whether or not in specifically older people living with HIV, whether or not cannabis use was associated with antiretroviral adherence in people 40 years or older. And we hypothesized that current cannabis use would be associated with decreased art adherence as compared to individuals identified as past use and non-use. Um, there are a couple caveats to, um, and limitations to the way that we did this study. Um, again, we used the participants that uh, were uh, in the HALO cohort, however, we were basing our analysis on and, and definition of cannabis use as people who reported self-reported two or more substance use uh, um, incidences when they were, came in for their biannual exam. And so, um, as, and they had to have a matched adher uh, adherence survey at the same time as their substance use survey. So limited the number, we still had a great number of people, but again, 
self-reported cannabis use isn't always as robust as when we can look at it and specifically define cannabis based off of measuring the metabolites and the cannabinoids in the plasma. So this is, we'll, we'll take the, these results with a grain of salt, um, but just to point that out uh, right off the bat. Um, we did some really fancy statistics um, in order to model whether or not cannabis usage was associated with our adherence. Um, these are just some, some specifics for how we did the tests. We used inverse probability weighting to adjust for confounding factors and dropout. Um, and what was uh, one thing we really wanted to include was a sex stratified estimate. So we not only did a total group of ev all the individuals together, but we also separated out um, by individuals that um, identify, were identified as uh, male or female at birth. Um, one thing we really want to point out is that um, we didn't unfortunately have gender identity available in this subset. It would have been really great to include that, but all we had um, uh, that was collected as part of this study was um, sex at birth. Um, but in the future, that would be something very important, I think, to look at. Um, so this was our subset of individuals. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I think I see a, a hand raised. Yeah, Kate, go ahead. Yeah, so in this study with the um, people that are 40 plus years with um, HIV, um, is this going to be something that is going to be continued to be studied? And um, are you guys going to need participants for this study? Or is so, it even here in the state of Washington yet? So, uh, Really great questions, and I would love to do that. Um, these, this was all a retrospective analysis, so it's through the HALO cohort, um, which is, and it's currently an ongoing, and they still have people participating in it. I think, unfortunately, they've stopped not only enrollment, but I think they're going to stop following individuals, and that's purely a, uh, um, a, a oops, a, a funding consideration. I think that um, the ACTG is evaluating which studies are going to continue to enroll and, and be followed. Um, and which ones unfortunately are gonna stop. I would love to follow up because all of what I'm gonna show you next is really just an analysis of um, reported data. We're, we didn't do any lab analyses, which I would really like to do because um, I think aging is very important. Um, and especially looking at something like this among an, an aging cohort would be great. But unfortunately at this point, we're, we're not quite sure whether or not we'd be able to do that either through HALO um, I'd like to, you know, submit some grants to follow this separately, but, and we could use this as, as um, support for doing a study like that. Um, but at the time, there, at this time, there's no specific plans. Okay. Kate, so you, so you know that this, this group of people in this study, this came out of another study. That was another long time study where you were studying people with HIV over a long time. Um, and so, some of them met certain criteria and they were allowed to go into the study, but this study didn't really, I don't think, recruit people like you think of normal recruitment where there's someone who's looking, we have a study, we open it up to everybody. These people were actually carried over from a study that was also a long term. So we have lots of data. That's why um, Jennifer's so excited about using this particular cohort or this group of people, because we can trace things over a wider time period, which gives you more to say. Yeah, that's why I was asking if they were going to be recruiting for this yeah. study or if it's an ongoing study that's already been being done. Right. So it's, but all, I didn't, I, it's ongoing, so, but not recruiting. Yeah. So hmm. now, now, can you also come up with some of this data uh, for people from simple blood draws that are um, daily regular users? Sure. I mean, I think that that's something that we could certainly, you know, it depends on, um, I can't remember what exactly the, the age range was for the study that we did, for example, at, at UW. Um, but certainly that's something that I think would be a better measure, right? Like if we could do blood draws and look not just at what's happening uh, immune wise, but also at the cannabis levels, as well as, um, you know, measuring exactly what's available in terms of the the, uh, the art that's in the, uh, being used by the, the participant. Um, yes, I think that that's absolutely yeah, something that could be done, just not how we did it here. Yeah, yeah. But I just, from my understanding of cannabis, it stays longer in your bloodstream than it does stay, stay in your body. Mm. So I, I could be wrong on that, but that's what was my understanding of it. There's definitely um, uh, some differences in what stays around as well. 
So for example, THC specifically, that particular cannabinoid doesn't stick around for very long at all anywhere. Mm. But some of these other metabolites do, do stick around a bit longer, which is why we can use it as a better measure for what is, um, who is a cannabis user, how long it sticks around can also dictate how much they use because they might have a higher level of the ones that stick around for longer versus the ones that dissipate quite quickly. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely lots of, uh, detailed information that we can get. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. So, um, cutting right to the chase, what we found in this study was that, uh, when we looked specifically at, um, uh, cannabis users versus non-cannabis users, there was a significant association between, um, decreased cannabis adherence and uh, current cannabis use. So essentially what, what I'm trying to say is that people that identified as using cannabis daily um, or more than daily had less uh, adherence to their antiretrovirals. Um, whereas people that were intermittent users, so maybe used once a week, once a month, or people that were identified themselves as never having used cannabis had no association between the um, adherence to their antiretroviral regimen um, and cannabis use, suggesting that yes, cannabis use could be having an effect on how well you're suppressed based off of how often you are taking your medication. And what we found was that this, this model or this association persisted among male users, but not among female users. And so that was really interesting to see that we did see a sex uh, association between um, cannabis use and adherence to antiretroviral regimens. Um, I think that the reasons behind that are unclear at the moment. Um, it would be really great to understand whether there is a potential sex bias here, um, but we unfortunately in this study can't identify the cause of that mm. or the association with that. Um, so just some, some quick conclusions. This was a really small, um, very uh, exciting study to do. Um, and what we were able to again show is that current cannabis using people with HIV have a higher risk of being less than 100% adherent to their art regimen when compared to intermittent or non-users. Um, and again, findings are consistent among specifically just the male individuals, but not the female participants. Um, this does have, we think, potentially some clinical implications because if you are less adherent to your antiretrovirals, again, it's associated with less effective viral suppression, could be um, causing a risk for drug resistance or um, uh, uh, development of comorbidities. And so what we would really like to do in the future is again, to, to really dig into this a little bit more. Like I said, this was a smaller retrospective analysis. We just had the reports from the individuals as opposed to being able to do really specific detailed lab assessments. Um, but I would, I'd love to follow up on this and to look at biobehavioral characteristics, sex specific characteristics and mechanisms to really understand what it could be about cannabis usage that could drive decreased art adherence. Um, and I think this is just really interesting because it highlights very, I, I, I like showing the two different stories side by side because it's interesting, whereas in, uh, it kind of highlights what we are finding um, in the field at, at large, right? Like our first study shows these really um, great beneficial effects of, of cannabis usage, whereas potentially it could also be a double-edged sword because if you're less adherent to your medication, those beneficial effects aren't going to be um, uh, fully realized. So it's, it's, there's still a ton of work to be done and some really exciting, uh, work to do out there. Um, I will just wrap up with some acknowledgements and then definitely happy to stay and chat further. Um, first of all, uh, um, thank you so much to my mentor, Nikki Klatt, um, who I didn't realize would be here tonight, but it's so <laughs> exciting that she is. <laughs> the power of Facebook. Uh, <laughs> now it's uh, power, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and everyone that was in the lab at the time, the, the lab has morphed a lot uh, since the time that we did the study. But these are the people that contributed while we were while we were there uh, working on this uh, study. Um, people at UW, Nina and her lab were the ones that really have been driving our ability to look specifically at the different cannabinoids uh, in both our studies. Um, everyone at the ACTU really, Nikki already said this, but this work would not be possible without your efforts. Um, and we really appreciate all that you've done for us um, in driving forward these really exciting studies. Um, 
for uh, Peter Hunt was the our contact that um, allowed us to do our first analysis on the scope cohort. Um, the ACTG study team that I worked with for the analysis on um, the HALO participants um, and of course our funding sources, but most importantly um, to all of the study participants, really without whom none of this would be possible. Um, I was just saying to um, uh, my graduate student who was around, but um, I think she maybe had to hop off, um, but really the um, the whole HIV field is 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 because of the community that really allows us to to investigate these things, and we do the work for you, and we appreciate so much your support of our research because it's without you, it's not possible. So thank you. Well, I've always said that cannabis smoking weed has been the one thing that's kept me um, as healthy as I have been over the years, mm -hmm. and there has been no no documentation to it or. And my doctor disagreed with me on that. I just, I, I think, I honestly think that because overall it lowers your stress level. You eat, most people eat when they're on it. Um, and even if you're missing one or two of your doses, maybe one or two doses every once in a while, because of smoking weed, you're still getting enough of your doses to, to re have the re virus resistant. Mm. So. Yeah, but, and Kate, you're lucky because you're a woman. If you think of what she just mm -hmm. told us with the research, it was the men who were having the difficulty remembering to take their pills, supposedly, uh, so using cannabis. Well, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but I'm just saying, you yeah. know, it was showing that women didn't have a problem with uh, the, adhe uh, the adherence as much as it was for men. Yeah, well. <laughs> so women, you're just living you're just living it out <laughs> women are more trained to do more things all at once too uh, uh you're very right see that's what i think she was talking about like trying to suss this out because i had lots of questions about that like did you look at any neurological conditions like were there other yeah. influences besides cannabis or other reasons why maybe they took cannabis that may have also been leading to this as opposed to just cannabis alone you know because it almost fits the stereotype of like oh potheads who become forgetful about things and so oops i forgot to take my meds we could all see it haha ha. but you know yeah not ha -ha. yeah absolutely so so this um <coughs> this was done through uh a, a, what it's, it's called a data analysis concept sheet and we had two aims in this and the first one was to look at art adherence as sort of a readout for an effect that the cannabis use could be having among this particular population but our second aim is to actually look, and they did do cognitive tests um, mm. at their at their annual exams in the HALO cohort, um, and not just cognitive. Um, they also did um, frailty assessments. And so, what we're going to be able to do is go back to those data and separate out the males and females and cannabis users and non-users and intermittent users, um, and be able to suss out um, eventually what we're going to be able to uh, suss out what, what is happening between, um, not just our adherence, but this other mechanism of, um, what's been seen in HIV infected individuals. Mm. And, um, it's definitely, it would be my dream to not only do these analyses, um, among what has been reported and what the participants are self-reporting, but mm -hmm. to also, um, there is a sample repository from the HALO cohort. They don't have a lot of uh, different types of samples available, but they certainly have plasma and they have PBMCs as well stored from each of the different longitudinal time, uh, longitudinal time that the individuals were enrolled. And so I would, I'm, that's my next grant to write is essentially um, getting funding to be able to uh, get samples from the repository and to do the cannabis metabolites and to look at inflammation. Cause that's another thing that they haven't been able to do in the halo cohort is to look at markers of inflammation. Um, and so if we could uh, secure some funds in order to do that, we could very easily, the samples are available. So if we could really tease out what's happening there, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would. Well, m cannabis is more of a natural, it, it grows naturally. It's not something that's been manufactured through pharmacies and stuff like that. So um, with with studying this, and I heard a lot about male to female vers uh, versus and how it would affect each one of them, males versus females. 
but you didn't talk too much overall about all the nationalities like African American, Indian, Asian, um, white, Caucasian, you know, all, everybody else. What what is if it's going to have a different effect because of the different nationalities? Good question, Kate. What about those races and ethnicities? Absolutely. That's a really great question. Um, we did include um, uh, ethnicity and race in our analyses, and we adjusted for it when we did those really fancy statistical models. Um, there didn't seem to be any effect of race. Admittedly, our cohort, at least for the HALO cohort, was very heavily weighted to Caucasians. Um, so it's possible that we could be seeing race effects had we had a better sample size. Um, um, that was more evenly distributed in terms of race and ethnicity, but at least what our statistical analyses are showing is that it wasn't affecting our results. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, so I think well, the, I, my question is, if we are looking at the end goal of having cannabis become some sort of medicine that helps people with HIV and where we are right now in the research, how much distance do you see between where we are now and that fateful day? <laughs> so we, and I know that that's kind of like, that's asking like, when are we going to have an HIV cure? Or when are we going to have an HIV vaccine? I'm not hoping, <laughs> but I'm trying to get an idea of where this, like how much more of this sort of stuff needs to happen before we can get to that fateful day, do you think? Like, what is the step? <laughs> Because I know that's what people are hoping, like to see that this becomes some sort of medicinally used, like, and that we have proof that it's of medicinal benefit and doctors can say that this is this. And if, even if it's not cannabis, but a cannabis derivative, you know, like what I, I'm just asking for you to project the forward. The future. <laughs> well, the are we talking pie in the sky and it's going to be 50 years from now? <laughs> um, so... I, <laughs> I hate predicting things because yeah. I, I just, as a scientist, I need like proof. Um, but uh, I, I suspect that um, cannabis as a therapeutic that is prescribed in that way will probably never happen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I think there are too many things that it, I just don't think that, that that's ever going to be approved. Okay. I think what is more likely is use developing some type of therapeutic that is a derivative, like a like uh, like a non psychoactive cannabinoid derivative mm. that could be used to, to elicit the same effects that we see. It's true that there are a lot of different things in cannabis, and we just don't have the knowledge yet to identify which things are important and to develop a therapeutic like that that could be used in conjunction with art. But um, I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in order to figure out what that is and how we can move forward with something like that. And just prescribing, you know, pot in order to, to alleviate these things. I think that that, or, or as like a, as a registered, like, you know, this is going to do some, like do this exact effect that we want. I don't, I, I highly <laughs> doubt that that could potentially happen, but uh, um, a, a medication that is derived from, knowledge that we gain in doing these types of studies? Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, if um, Marinol has the same kind of effects as um, no. looking at, at, at smokers? So there's exactly one study that I'm av aware of that looked at Marinol, and I don't think it, it showed the same types of, of, of effects that uh, whole cannabis usage was having. Um, so I, I don't think so, but I think there's only one study, so it's possible that more work could show something different. So Jennifer, someone else was pointing out, uh, I think it was Dr. Robert Wood pointing out that like, for instance, in Canada, uh, cannabis is already therapeutically used for HIV and other things. He was saying other places have already kind of done that too. So I guess we were speaking from a U.S. centric point of view in terms of and that. and that's that's something that's very important to point out is my my comment was definitely a U.S. centric <laughs> point of view um, and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, there is a very robust group that is uh, I believe it's M.J. Malloy is leading that group in Canada um, that's looking at a lot of the the um, uh, uh, cannabis use studies in Canada and there's also a group in Montreal 
Um, I can't remember the last author now, um, but there, there are at least two really um, uh, focused groups in Canada that are looking at, at cannabis use and particularly among uh, people living with HIV. Um, and um, uh, I'm trying to, there was a question that everything flew by quickly. So uh, uh, Dr. Wood was also saying that we may need to narrow down which elements um, may be the most active for which purposes that we have. It might be releasing more than one potential uh, in, uh, intervention from that. I agree completely. Um, other questions that people had. I see, uh, Brittany, you've written a few things. I don't know if you wanted to speak. Um, well, we had a question from her that I could read to you that she wanted to know, where can we continue to follow this work? Oh, um, well, uh, hopefully <laughs> my goal is to have the, the data from the, our first analyses of the HALO cohort published soon. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure when we'll be able to get the analysis from the, the second aim to um, look at the neurocognitive effects and frailty. That's, that analysis hasn't started yet. Right. Um, those analyses, excuse me. Right. Um, and uh, so I guess uh, just stay in touch. <laughs> um, and uh, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me. I know that Nikki's team is definitely moving forward um, with working on the samples that the ACTU has helped us to collect. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's going to be some really exciting that work that comes out um, in the near future as well. Right. Um, and I was also going to say you could just follow the ACTG because since you're doing this, they'll definitely publish the results. They might not make a big, big deal of them like we've done tonight by focusing in on them and talking about them a bit. But nonetheless, you'd be able to follow them that way. So even if we were to all lose touch with each other, Brittany, um, you know, like that's one way. The network will still be around, hopefully, <laughs> for years to come <laughs> until, until it's no longer needed. But we will have it. And, you know, that, that would be the best way to keep in touch with that to see if anything comes up from that. And then always, you know, search engines because we're not the only people working on this. So every once in a while, put in cannabis HIV research and see what comes up you might be surprised at what you might find. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Do we have any final questions that we wanted to ask of Jennifer? Jennifer, I do have one last question. Where are oh, you? Please. Where did you go? Oh. <laughs> Everybody I around. am at Tulane University at the Louisiana Climate Research Center. So I'm in, Orleans. I'm in NOLA. <laughs> you need to invite me. That's where I moved from. Well, come down anytime. I mean, not when you're her. Y'all heard her. I, I am going to pick you up on that. Watch out. I mean, <laughs> y'all are safe to travel. Please do come. But you know, <laughs> Gas Fest is coming. And she can she can keep studying HIV positive people because we're all primates. There we go. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Please, I, I would love question. to host all of you. I have a quick question. Um, in Brazil, I read a study, um, there was a doctor out there who was um, treating patients, not HIV positive patients, but other patients that were basically told that they were going to be like given medication, get comfortable and get ready to die um, with um, juicing the cannabis plant. Is there any interest in maybe doing a study in, in that side of it? Because actually the most medical benefits from what I did my research after reading that study is in the actual plant itself, mm. the medical benefits. Mm. So I'm, I'm just, I'm asking her if she can foresee maybe trying to get a grant to do that type of a study. Mm -hmm. So, What's what I didn't mention, um, and uh, thank you for bringing this up. Um, one of the things that actually we will be able to, to identify in um, the study that we're doing with the ACTU is to look at routes of consumption. So one of the caveats, actually caveats for both the HALO analysis, as well as the analyses that we did with this, uh, um, the uh, scope cohort is that it was just reported use and it didn't record how the cannabis was consumed. And so we are recording that information in the ACTU study. So we'll be able to tease apart uh, 
you know, how how that could affect what we're seeing. Um, it sort of depends on how many individuals we get that are consuming in a certain way. If we have, if we're, if we'd be powered enough to to really make some um, uh, uh, hard conclusions on that, um, but I think we'll be able to at least start getting at that kind of a question: is is how the consumption could be affecting um, the outcomes? Okay. So I'd, I'd really would like to see a study do on the juicing of the plant and see how well that works with HIV positive people or, or people that just got diseases overall, doesn't matter if it's HIV or not, because um, I, I did an extensive research back then after I read his article on it and the testimony from some of his patients. And um, I did find out that the, the medical benefits are actually in the plant itself. So you can get in the can cannabinoids in that are med that you can use for the medical benefits in the buds too, but you're getting more of it from the actual plant, from the leaves in the in the plant, the stems of the plant itself. So, okay. yeah, I mean, look, look it up. Um, juicing the plant for um medical benefits. Um, it was in, I, I'm pretty sure it was a doctor in Brazil, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. I will certainly be looking that up. Yeah, right. it's a really interesting read, and um, there's I just I would like to see something go into that aspect of it. Just I know this is all early in early stages, and you're still trying to get the grants to continue the studies and all that. But um, it's just I mean it's it's open for I'm trying to open the door on the talk of maybe possibilities of having that type of study, and that's your job. That's your job, Kate. Like, that's what the community does. They speak up these things and they say what they think and they say what's important to them. And they tell researchers that. And then there's hopefully some sort of marriage between the two that happens because they see a direct benefit. You know, like, in other words, that's yeah. what you're doing by advocating, just by speaking, saying what you yeah. think. Um, I just also wanted to let you all know that um, I've just put in uh, some recent research from Europe that was about cannabis and covid so, you know, you might want to take a look at that as well. If you're curious, I just put that into the chat. And if you don't forget, you might want to go backwards in the chat because I did put the three links to this Thursday's conversation at 2 p.m. And then also May 20th, the Clinical Trials Awareness Day event. And then June 2nd is also up there for you. Um, the first two you have to register for, the last one, the AIDS at 40, you don't have to. And I'll be sending emails out to you as well. So and uh, pushing those uh, events for you all. But I wanted to wrap up things here and I wanted to thank you very, very, very much, Jennifer. You did a wonderful job. I thought it was great. It's great to see you. I love you are rocking those glasses. And <laughs> it's gonna be awesome that way. Um, so everyone, I'm so happy to see you here and thank you for showing up. And I'm sure people would love to talk to you. So if you wanna hang around afterwards a little bit, they can chat with you a little bit more just like after a meeting normally would be. <laughs> um, that would be great. And um, I just want to say good night and thank you all for uh, giving us a chance and learning some stuff with us. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.